Vice President Mike Pence went to the Middle East this month and he visited Egypt, where he hung out with the authoritarian U.S. backed dictator Abdel Fattah el Sisi before heading to Jordan in his campaign to flaunt President Trump's hardline and contentious position on moving the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem. Mike Pence ended his trip, of course, in Israel, and he gave a speech to the Israeli parliament, the Knesset. Many U.S. presidents have said that the United States recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and have said, As soon as I take office, I will begin the process of moving the United States ambassador to the city of Israel as chosen as its capital. I continue to say that uh, Jerusalem will be the capital of Israel, and I have said that before, and I will say it again. What's new here is that Trump is the first president to state that the embassy will be moved to the holy city. Last month, I also took an action endorsed unanimously by the U.S. Senate just months before. I recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The peace talks that Trump has put Jared Kushner in charge of appear to be going swimmingly. Palestine boycotted Mike Pence's trip. Its leaders refused to meet with him. Mike Pence's trip comes on the heels of last month's status of Jerusalem vote at the United Nations General Assembly, where the overwhelming majority of nations in the world voted against the U.S. position that Jerusalem is Israel's capital, and they passed a resolution calling on nations not to move their embassies to Jerusalem. As the U.S. often does, under both Democrats and Republicans, at the United Nations, Trump's ambassador, Nikki Haley, along with the president himself, bullied and threatened countries and actually kind of threatened the whole of the United Nations, Nikki Haley said she would be taking names that the U.S. would remember this day and would look at cutting funds to those who voted against the U.S. position. The only countries that did support Washington were Togo, Micronesia, Nauru, Palau, Marshall Islands, Guatemala, and Honduras. All of this comes as one of the most underreported stories of the Trump era continues to receive scant attention in the United States, namely evidence that the Trump administration has colluded with the state of Israel, including efforts to attempt to get Russia to aid Israel in undermining the Obama administration at the United Nations while Obama was still president. I'm joined now from Amman, Jordan by Ali Abu Nima. He is the founder of electronicintifada.net and the author of two books, One Country, A Bold Proposal to End the Israeli-Palestinian Impasse, and Battle for Justice in Palestine, The Case for a Single Democratic State in Palestine. Ali Abu Nima, welcome to Intercepted. Thank you, Jeremy. Let's start, first of all, with the most recent developments uh, with Vice President Mike Pence going to Israel. What are your thoughts on that visit and the impact and the message that the Trump administration continues to send to Israel? The message it sends was really made visual in what happened in the Knesset, uh, where Pence gave this sort of Christian Zionist fanatical speech. But just last month, President Donald Trump made history. He righted a 70-year wrong. He kept his word to the American people when he announced that the United States of America will finally acknowledge Jerusalem is Israel's capital. And when the 13 Arab Israeli or Palestinian Israeli lawmakers stood up to protest and held signs saying Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine, they were dragged out bodily by Uh, security while Netanyahu and his government were applauding. And this was such a shocking and blatant scene, I think, for many people that even NBC's Andrea Mitchell, and that's not a network known for uh, taking big risks when it comes to Israel, tweeted, imagine what it would look like if the Capitol Police dragged members of the Congressional Black Caucus off the House floor. That was actually a pretty good analogy for what was happening. And Trump followed it up in Davos by saying because Palestinian leaders refused to meet Pence, that uh, he was going to further punish the most vulnerable Palestinians, uh, threatening to cut even more aid from the uh, humanitarian agency UNRWA. When they disrespected us a week ago by not allowing our great vice president to see them, 
and we give them hundreds of millions of dollars in aid and support. Tremendous numbers. Numbers that nobody understands. That money is on the table, and that money is not going to them unless they sit down and negotiate peace. In some ways, I think it's a more honest expression of U.S. policy. Not exactly refreshing, but definitely honest. And what about Jared Kushner that Trump has put in this position of, quote unquote, making a deal between the Palestinians and the Israelis? Basically, what it amounts to is pushing the Palestinians to a total surrender, where they would be given a state in name only, what would more accurately be called a Bantustan, the sort of fake state set up by the apartheid government of South Africa in the 1970s and 80s to say, look, black people have their own independent states now, so stop asking us to end apartheid. That's basically the approach the Israelis want to take. And the outline is a few enclaves totally surrounded by Israel, nothing in Jerusalem, no right of return for Palestinian refugees, uh, but you can call this a state if you want to. That's the direction it's going. I think, to be fair to the Trump administration, this is the direct descendant of all the so-called American peace plans that various administrations have pushed for decades since Bill Clinton. The big difference here, I think, is the regional situation or architecture where now the Trump administration is teaming up with a major power in the region, Saudi Arabia, and to a lesser extent, Egypt. So they have signed up to help bully and pressure the Palestinians into accepting this. And that's part of the kind of regional approach of taking the Saudis, the Israelis, the Egyptians, and the other so-called Sunni Arab states, aligning them together in a big confrontation with Iran. Let's get the Palestinians out of the way. This is a thorn in the side. Let's force them to surrender. And then we can say that that issue is done with. On this issue of Trump physically moving the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, he and his administration are now saying that that is going to happen on a faster timetable than they originally had intended. What's actually going on here? Where the U.S. ambassador sits is really of little practical concern to Palestinians. What happened with the Jerusalem issue with Trump's announcement back in December of U.S. recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital is very interesting because this was clearly a demand from the far right, particularly the radical Christianist base of the Republican Party in the United States for many, many years. And so Trump gave them that. What it means politically is very interesting because at the time Trump made that announcement, he said, well, we're recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, but we are definitely not taking a position on final status issues, the borders of Israeli sovereignty, you know, whether the Palestinians will have any rights in Jerusalem or so on. That's what he said back in December when he made the announcement. But what he said in Davos and what he said before that, is I took Jerusalem off the table. Hardest subject they had to talk about was Jerusalem. We took Jerusalem off the table. So we don't have to talk about it anymore. They never got past Jerusalem. So he's undercutting his own assurance that he wasn't trying to predetermine the issue and take away Palestinian rights. The other effect of what he did, which I think could be put in the category of unintended consequences, is he united pretty much the whole world in standing up and saying, we reject the Israeli and American position on Jerusalem. So whereas the issue had been dormant for many years, to the point where I think the Israelis really thought that if the Americans make this announcement, the rest of the world will sort of quietly follow on. What actually happened was 
a pretty unanimous vote in the UN condemning the US decision and calling it null and void. So in a sense, Trump helped to re reawaken opposition to Israeli and American positions on Jerusalem. You're talking about the UN process, and of course, Israelis' occupation of Palestine is regularly condemned by the overwhelming majority of nations uh, of the world represented at the UN. And I want to ask you, though, about one specific vote that occurred at the end of President Obama's time in office. And this has been discussed in some media outlets, but really hasn't been as big of a story as obviously should be. And that is this vote that the Obama administration uh, was indicating it was going to abstain from. The Trump camp was apoplectic over. And Jared Kushner, who, as we know, is has been designated by Trump as the peacemaker here, was at an event with Haim Sabin, who is a major Democratic Party fundraiser. An issue that uh, I personally want to thank you for. You and your team were... Uh, taking steps to try and get the uh, United Nations Security Council to not go along with what ended up being an abstention by the U.S. against 50-year-old tradition. Uh, some people might criticize, as far as I know, there's nothing illegal there, but uh, I think that this crowd and myself want to thank you for making that effort. So thank you very much. They talked to the Russian ambassador, not about Russia's agenda, but trying to pressure Russia into taking a pro-Israel position on behalf of the incoming Trump administration. What, what's going on here? What came out back in December in the context of Michael Flynn's plea deal was that Flynn had lied to the FBI about two conversations with the Russian ambassador. And all of this got reported in, you know, the mainstream U.S. media, what I call regime media, and that includes uh, MSNBC, you know, very breathlessly as more evidence of collusion with between the Trump people and the Russians. In fact, what the Flynn plea deal showed and what the proffer and the documents that were filed in federal court showed was not Flynn's collusion with Russia in order to serve Russian interests, but rather an attempt to serve Israeli interests. And in short, what happened, Benjamin Netanyahu asked Jared Kushner to do everything possible to undermine the Obama administration's policy. This was during the transition. So Obama was still president, but the Trump transition team was asked by Netanyahu to contact all these governments, including Russia, to try to sabotage the vote that was taking place in the UN in December 2016, condemning Israel's settlements in occupied Palestinian land. The effort failed. The vote passed. The Obama administration abstained. But what was actually happening was the Trump team was colluding with the foreign power to undermine U.S. policy. But that foreign power was Israel, not Russia. And of course, um, Michael Wolff in his book, Fire and Fury, does quote Steve Bannon, lay out what you learned about Trump collusion with Israel from Michael Wolff's book, Fire and Fury. The book recounts a conversation between Bannon and Roger Ailes early on during the transition when they're talking about who to appoint and what the administration's first moves will be. And Bannon says, you know, day one, we're going to move the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem. Let Jordan deal with the West Bank, let Egypt deal with uh, Gaza, or let them go down trying. And he says, Netanyahu's on board, Sheldon Adelson is on board, and that's what we're going to do. So this is an Israel-first agenda. And what Bannon is saying, you know, he mentions Sheldon Adelson, who gave, what was it, $25, $30 million to the Trump campaign through various uh, vehicles and five million to the Trump inauguration committee, and he is calling the shots. This has gotten 
no play in U.S. media. Imagine if this was a Russian oligarch instead of a pro-Israel oligarch, basically dictating the foreign policy of the Trump administration. You'd have Rachel Maddow screaming it from the rooftops. But instead, there's silence. Now, the other thing, you mentioned Haim Saban. Haim Saban is basically the democratic Sheldon Adelson. And so when he was on stage with Jared Kushner back in December at this Brookings uh, forum, Saban and Kushner were getting on like a house on fire, even though Haim Saban had put millions of dollars into trying to get Hillary Clinton elected. Because when it comes to fanatical, extreme, unconditional support for Israel, that's the last truly bipartisan issue. Maybe that and war and, you know, secret surveillance. The other interesting trend that I think is worth noting is that what's happening on the ground, and this is being shown off in survey after survey after survey, and that came out again with the Pew Research Center poll, that Israel is now completely a partisan issue in the United States. And that Pew poll 79% of Republicans sympathize more with Israel than with the Palestinians, but just 27% of Democrats say that. And in a poll last year, more than half of Democrats said they would support sanctions or tougher measures on Israel because of its settlements. That's what's happening in the country. That's what's happening in the grassroots. The growing support for Palestinian rights, opposition to the unquestioning support for Israel, but it is not being reflected by political elites, and it's not being reflected by media elites, which is why we have this total silence from CNN to Fox to MSNBC, you know, the so-called political spectrum of U.S. regime media.